Hey there, I'm Safina and welcome to my channel where we talk about everything that you need to know for your next backpacking or hiking trip. And today I'm super excited to talk about waterborne pathogens. So this is the things in the water that can make you sick. So first of all, what are they and how do they get into the water? What are some treatment methods available and why are some of them better than others? And then lastly, if you watched my 10 tips for backpacking with a dog, um, I promised that I would answer the question of whether or not you need to treat the water that your dog drinks while out on the trail. And the answer might surprise you, so stick around until the end. I also have another video coming out where we're going to compare the, 10, um, the top 10 methods on the REI website for water treatment to see which one is the best for you. So if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe so that you can be notified of when that video goes live. And lastly, a fun fact, Eric and I are actually both PhDs. My PhD is in immunology, so the study of your immune system, and then his is in microbiology. So we are super qualified to be making this video. Um, yeah, let's get into it. So what is it in the water that makes you sick? Well. There are viruses like norovirus and rotavirus. There are bacteria like E. coli, Shigella, Salmonella, and Campylobacter. And there are parasites like Giardia and Cryptosporidium that can all be contaminating the water. Now, not all viruses, bacteria, and parasites make us sick, but these ones do, and so we call them pathogens. Since diarrhea is the most common recreational water illness, we're gonna focus on the pathogens that cause it. Um, but there are other pathogens that cause things like skin rash, um, ear and eye pain, congestion. So if you want me to do another video on other waterborne pathogens such as cyanobacteria, let me know down in the comments. So transmission of these pathogens that we mentioned are all through the fecal oral route. And this means that if an infected person or animal poops in or near the water, the pathogenic viruses, bacteria, and parasites from the poop then contaminates the water. And then if somebody comes along and drinks that contaminated water, they can become infected. And then if this newly infected person or animal poops in or near the water, the cycle then continues. So pooping into the water, drinking poopy water, um, and then pooping in the water again. So it makes sense that areas with high levels of human and animal activity in the water, like urban parks and rangeland where livestock are being kept, are at higher risk for water contamination. While water in remote areas like alpine lakes with little human and animal activity generally have little contamination. So this is why when you're out backpacking or hiking, you really need to think about where you're pooping. So first off, you want to find a spot that is downstream of where you and others would go to get water. So in case of any contamination, uh, you're not pulling water from nearby. You also wanna be at least 200 feet away from the water source, so rivers, lakes, or streams. And to give you a visual, that would be about four semi-truck trailers. So quite a distance. You also want to bury your poop in an eight inch deep hole so that if it rains, you know, your poop doesn't just wash into the water. Also, nobody wants to be hiking and then come across human poop. Some places actually don't allow you to bury your poop and you have to pack it out. So just make sure you know the regulations of the place that you're going. And then lastly, of course, always wash your hands either with soap or hand sanitizer um, after you do your business so that you don't accidentally uh, get it into your mouth. So all of these pathogens that we've talked about can all cause diarrhea, vomiting, cramps, and fever when they're ingested. But 
all have slightly different times to symptom onset and also the duration of these symptoms. So for viruses, these are gonna be the quickest with symptom onset between six and 72 hours and the symptoms lasting between two to three days. Bacteria have symptom onset between eight hours and four days, so a little longer, and then they can last between three and seven days. And then parasites have a longer symptom onset between one and two weeks, and they can last much longer, so multiple weeks. So how do you avoid getting sick? Well, you can start with choosing a safer water source. So you want to target naturally flowing water, such as streams and rivers, as any pathogens that are present are going to be constantly diluted by the flow of that water. You don't want to take from shallow standing water because if there is any contamination, it's just going to remain concentrated and more likely to make you sick. You also want to avoid any foul smelling water or murky water with foam and scum on the surface because these can be indications of contamination. And the clarity of the water can also play into the effectiveness of different water treatments, which we'll talk about next. So we're gonna look at the top five ways that you can treat your water to make it safe to drink. And this includes boiling, filtering out the pathogens, killing them using halogens or chemicals like chlorine um, or iodine. Um, you can also use chlorine dioxide to kill them. And then lastly, ultraviolet light. And so the ultraviolet light is actually damaging their DNA so that they can't be infectious anymore. These are all highly used methods of water treatment, but by no means are they equal in terms of their ability to remove viruses, bacteria, and parasites that can make you sick. So let's take a closer look at them. Boiling is the first method, so you'll need to have a full rolling boil for one minute if you're at an elevation below 6,500 feet. But if you're in the mountains above 6,500 feet, you actually have to boil for longer, so for three minutes. And this is because the higher you are in elevation, the lower the temperature required to boil the water. And so then you have to boil the water longer in order to efficiently kill all of the pathogens. The great thing about boiling is that it does kill all of the pathogens, so the viruses, the bacteria, and the parasites, so it's a nice catch-all. And this method doesn't depend on the clarity of the water, so if your water is cloudy, boiling is still gonna work. So this method is really quick and easy, but you'll need to bring a lot of fuel depending on how long you'll be out, and this adds both weight and cost. In this video here, we tested how long it took different camp stoves to boil water and how much fuel it took. So the less efficient your stove, the more fuel you're going to have to bring. The National Academy of Sciences determined that you should be drinking between three to four liters of water every day. And if you're out backpacking, you'll be sweating, you'll probably need a little bit more than that. So if we do a little math and estimate that it takes about eight grams of fuel to boil 500 mils of water and have it rolling boil for a minute. Uh, if we multiply that by eight to give us four liters, that's 64 grams of fuel for one day's worth of water. And for me, that would be a lot since I usually only bring a 110 gram fuel canister for a two to three day trip. This method also does not prevent recontamination of the water and it doesn't improve the taste. Filtration is probably the most used way to treat water while backpacking. Basically, you collect water and then push it through a filter into a clean container, which you'll drink out of. However, not all filters are made the same, so you have to check the label and know what you're looking for. The first thing to look for is pore size. So the pores are the tiny holes that let water through the filter. So think of them uh, like a strainer. The smaller the pore sizes, the smaller the pathogens that will be captured. To give us some scale, a human hair is 100 microns wide. 
Parasites are the largest of the pathogens, coming in around 4 to 19 microns. So you need a pore size of 1 micron to filter these out. Bacteria are even smaller at 0.5 to 10 microns, and so you need a 0.2 to 0.4 micron pore size. And then for viruses, these are the smallest of the pathogens at 0.03 microns, so you need a pore size of 0.01 microns in order to filter them out. So only a filter with a pore size of 0.01 microns would remove all of these diarrhea-causing pathogens from your water. So now that you know what pore size you're looking for, it's also important to know that there are different qualities of filters. So if your filter has an absolute pore size of one micron, this means that the filter has pores that are all one micron or smaller. But if you have a filter that has a nominal pore size of one micron, this just means that the average pore size is one micron. So some are smaller and some are larger. So you're not really filtering out everything that's larger than one micron. The pros for filtration are that it is really quick and easy to do, and it does improve the taste and the appearance of your water. The cons are most filters don't actually have a pore size small enough to remove pathogenic viruses. It does add a little bit of bulk and weight to your pack. It's one of the more expensive ways to treat your water. And since you're filtering out, you know, particles, pathogens, and all of that's getting captured in the filter, it eventually clogs and you'll have to do some maintenance on it to increase the life of your filter. If you're backpacking anywhere where it's freezing, the water will freeze within those little pores and then break them open. So it's gonna damage your filter and then you won't actually know how well you're filtering pathogens out. And then lastly, it doesn't prevent recontamination. So I know I did have a lot of cons for filtration, but you know, these are just things to think about. And again, this is one of the most used methods for treating your water. Chlorine and iodine are an inexpensive way to treat water. Uh, it comes in both liquid and tablet form. So you just drop the appropriate amount into your water and let it stand for 30 minutes before drinking. It's equally easy to treat large and small volumes of water, and it's the only method that protects against recontamination. These disinfectants are effective at removing harmful viruses and bacteria, but they're not as effective at removing parasites like Giardia, and they are not effective at removing Cryptosporidium. So this is why when somebody poops in the pool, um, you have to <laughs> close it down, not only because it's gross and they need to scoop the poop out, but also they need to raise the chlorine levels very high and maintain those levels for an extended period of time in order to kill these parasites. So chlorine and iodine also have an aftertaste um, that you may or may not enjoy. Iodine can also have some adverse effects, so it's not recommended for pregnant women, um, people with hypersensitivity to iodine or thyroid problems, um, or just extended. Um, use for more than a few weeks. And the effectiveness of the treatment decreases if the water is cloudy. So you'll need to pre-filter it somehow. Chlorine dioxide is the next method and it doesn't actually contain any chlorine despite its name. It's actually been used for over 50 years, so like since the 1940s by US and European cities to purify your water before it comes out of the tap at home. And unlike chlorine and iodine, chlorine dioxide doesn't create any potentially harmful byproducts, so you can use it for longer term. It also comes in both a liquid and tablet form, so you just add it to your water, let it sit for 15 minutes, and then it's ready to drink. So it's really easy to use and it can improve the taste of your water. It's also equally easy to treat large volumes and small volumes and is effective against all pathogens. Now, while it can kill viruses, bacteria, and Giardia in 15 minutes, it does take four hours to kill Cryptosporidium. So it's not ideal if you're worried about crypto. However, the main hosts for the type of crypto that infects humans are 
other humans and cattle. So again, if you're going somewhere remote, like an alpine lake, the risk of this type of contamination is really low. It also does not protect against recontamination. So the last method is ultraviolet light. And this is the quickest method to treat your water coming in at only 90 seconds. So you just stick your wand into your water bottle and then you swirl it around while the light is on. Um, and that's it. So pretty easy. Um, and it does kill all pathogens. So viruses, bacteria, and parasites. Now for the cons, it is the most expensive method coming in at between 90 and $120. You can only treat small quantities of water because the light needs to be able to reach um, the full volume. Uh, the efficacy will also be decreased if the water is cloudy because the particles can shield some of the pathogens from the light. Uh, and then looking at the reviews online, there were some concerns about batteries, uh, making sure that you have like a lithium battery so that it doesn't die during your trip when it gets cold. So. You kind of have to decide whether or not you feel comfortable relying on technology. <laughs> and then over time, you don't really know if your unit is still putting out the UV dose required uh, to kill all the pathogens. So I leave you with this table to show you the effectiveness of each of these methods against the different types of pathogens so that you can make the decision on which method is right for you and where you're going. It's also good to note that you can combine filtration with chlorine dioxide in order to remove all of these types of pathogens if you didn't want to do boiling or UV light. And for the last question, should you treat the water that your dog is drinking on the trail? The answer is, it depends. <laughs> so while dogs can be infected with some of these pathogens, they rarely have symptoms. And it's important to remember that animals are just natural carriers for some of these pathogens. Um, and that's why it's important that you wash your hands after you do things like bag their poop so that those pathogens don't get transmitted to you. Um, it's also important to make sure that you're paying attention to where they're pooping on the trail so that they don't contaminate the water. It's also going to depend on where you are. So again, areas with high levels of human and animal activity in the water or in developing areas with poor sanitation, these are places that are gonna be at higher risk for water contamination. And so in these cases, like urban parks, cattle ranch land, I would bring the water that my dog needs or I would treat it before I give it to them. If you're in a remote alpine area with very little human and animal activity, there's generally little contamination with these pathogens. So I would feel comfortable letting my dog drink from clear flowing water, but not from stagnant puddles or ponds. But if you don't feel comfortable making the decision of whether or not the water is going to be safe, then there's no harm in treating the water that you give to your dog. And that's it for this video. If you want me to dive deeper into any of those topics, please leave me a comment down below. And if you found this video helpful, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. I have new videos every Thursday. Until next time, I'll see you on the trail.